I'd rather do this like in my last breath when my boat is sinking and I'm happy and saying goodbye. Like that's what I want. I want to keep that culture alive, being just part of that. That's what innovation looks like to me, keeping the fabric and the complexity and the beauty of all of our cultures, the Troy cultures going. Welcome to Climate Positive, a podcast produced by Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions. I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. I'm Gil Jenkins. In this series, we host candid conversations with the leaders, innovators, and changemakers driving our climate positive future. In this episode, we talk with Bren Smith, a former commercial fisherman who is now the co founder and co executive director of Greenwave, a nonprofit dedicated to creating jobs and protecting the oceans through regenerative ocean farming. The oceans are taking a beating from climate change. It's estimated that they have absorbed nearly a third of the carbon released by humans. And this creates a whole host of problems as the carbon dissolves in salt water, making it more acidic while making it harder for calcifying organisms like oysters and coral to grow. Fishermen like Bren are on the front lines of this changing climate, but Bren shares how the oceans can be a source of renewal. Yvonne Chenard, founder of the sustainable clothing company Patagonia, has declared Bren a hero for his inexpensive system for growing food. Bren's ocean farming avoids the vices of land-based agriculture. It requires no inputs of pesticides, fresh water, or even land. But it produces nutrient-dense foods while absorbing carbon and nitrogen, creating habitat, and mitigating the impacts of storm surges. Talking with Bren made me more optimistic about the future of the planet. And we hope his story will inspire you as well. Friend, welcome to Climate Positive. We're thrilled to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. I, just, I, I can't believe you care about this. <laughs> so it's really, <laughs> it's really exciting. So thanks for having me. So you were born in Newfoundland to American parents and start off as a fisherman, have turned into a regenerative ocean farmer. What was your childhood like? Yeah, I mean, you know, my parents were out of Brooklyn and Stanford went over the border and like, you know, this VW bus, just classic kippies. They were, I don't think they call themselves draft dodgers, but draft dodgers, you know. <laughs> and um, I ended up up in Newfoundland and we ended up in a, a little town, Petty Harbor, a little town, a little part of Petty Harbor called Manic Scope. And it's the most Eastern point in all of North America, just the, the edge of the earth. Exactly what people would sort of conjure as an artisanal fishery back in the day. You know, I, there was a fisherman's co-op next door, our Houses were painted with leftover boat paints, so like blues, greens, oranges. You know, the saying was you, you painted your house that way so you could find your house when you're drunk in the fog, right? You know, it would be like a beacon <laughs> so you know which one you were. And, uh, you know, selling cod tongues door to door. And it was, it was just an idyllic, like hard scrabble life. I actually grew up with an extreme stutter. I couldn't speak. So I was like very silent my first bunch of years. And then one day they found me talking alone on the beach. Turns out I'd been talking on the beach a little away from people. It was just like I didn't want to make people. So I guess that was a good sign for me in the ocean, right? It was my comfort zone, my safe space. So from your early days, you've been earning a living on the ocean. And then jumping forward to 1992, the Canadian government issued the moratorium on cod fishing due to massive stock depletion. So overnight, this directly impacted the livelihoods of about 30,000 people. How did that moment change how you think about fishing and earning a livelihood off of the ocean? I mean, you know, I dropped out of high school when I was 14 and headed out to sea. And, you know, I wanted one of those jobs. You know, a fisherman has a self-directed life. They own their own boat. They succeed and fail on their own terms. No boss. Like, in this pride of feeding your country. Like, there's a reason people write and sing songs about fishermen, farmers, co-workers like the cultural content of these jobs are just stunning and actually i think one of the big questions for us in the new climate economy and creating jobs is can we have these jobs that are soul filling right can the new climate economy tap into blue collar innovation and like there should be sea shanties about solar workers and and regenerative ocean farmers <laughs> like that's where that's where we need to get but anyway so like you know Commercial fisherman, that's what I wanted to do. And I was, and I fished the globe, ended up in Alaska, the Bering Sea. But as you said, when I was in the Bering Sea, I heard that the cod stocks crashed in Newfoundland. So I went back 
And it was stunning to go back. And to go back from like when I was a kid, young, and seeing fishing there to suddenly hungry ghosts walk in the streets, canneries emptied, you know, boats beached, an entire economy wiped out overnight that had been built up over hundreds of years, right? And that means culture gone. That means means livelihoods gone, like the entire fabric. And that's where I, you know, I didn't have full consciousness of it, but I was like, oh, there aren't going to be any jobs on a dead ocean. Like my livelihood, of course, is tied to it, but like I had been thinking environmentalism is about saving birds, bees, and bears. That's what like the environmentalists have been telling me. And I was like, you know, whatever, I don't care. And uh, I mean, I cared, but like, <laughs> like you know, like they <laughs> wasn't front and center. But like it turns out that environmentalism, newly conceived, is making sure that I can make a living on a planet. It's about kitchen table issues. So it's about jobs. It's about food. It's about family welfare. Like you need these things to save the birds and bees and bears. And in fact, you need us as humans to be working to breathe life back into the ecosystem. You know, whether it's capturing carbon or like, you know, feeding in regenerative ways. I think it's, you know, I say that a lot of environmentalists who are still conservationists who want to set aside they see what their work is saying, setting aside the ocean as marine protected zones is the most important thing. I think that's climate denial. Why is that? Yeah, so you could set aside the entire ocean at this point as a marine zone and still going to die because of climate change, because of acidification. That's like a Teddy Roosevelt form of environmentalism. Instead, we need a creative space where you have put people to work, breathing life back into the ocean. Like we can farm crops that capture carbon, nitrogen, literally produce oxygen, underwater trees, right? And rebuild reefs. And you don't want to set this side stuff apart. You want to integrate us as fishermen and farmers into marine protected zones so that there are these, you know, living ecosystems to go. And I think that's the new face. And I, I don't have a comfort zone really with the ocean conservation people. I don't have a comfort zone actually with like, the sort of Brooklyn foodie community. I feel so comfortable in the climate solutions space. There are millions of people out there trying to figure out how to do this nexus of using solving the climate crisis to create economic opportunity. And that's uh, so I still don't think of myself as an environmentalist at the end of the day. Let's back up a little bit because I want to touch on some of the stories that you raise in your book, Eat Like a Fish. It's a fantastic book. We read it for the Hannon Armstrong Book Club, and it just got everyone fired up about farming kelp. And in the book, you talk about the various jobs you've had throughout your life, working as a commercial fisherman, a lobsterman, raising oysters, raising farmed salmon. And you're now working as a regenerative ocean farmer. Why did you make these shifts? When I got out of the fisheries, because I was driven off the water into, you know, ocean agriculture and worked on the salmon farms, that, that was going to be the, the future. And, you know, instead, the salmon farms at that time was sort of pig farming at sea, monoculture used of pesticides, antibiotics, like just growing terrible food with terrible impact. And so I kept looking and I, the only thing I've done is refuse to leave the water. I've been pushed off many times, but I sort of claw my way back. And what happened in that, I became an oysterman. And what oysters taught me and the oyster industry taught me was like, oh, if you ask the ocean what to grow, like if you don't grow around markets, right? The reason we grow salmon and tuna and stuff is because that's what people want to eat. But that's backwards, right? You have to see what's unique about the ocean's agricultural space and what's possible. And we do that. The ocean's like, well, hell, why don't you grow things that don't swim away and you don't have to feed? And oysters taught me that, right? I was like, oh, I put in seed, I grow them in cages, I nurture them, and then I harvest them. I've got zero inputs. I don't have to feed them. I don't have to give any fertilizer. I don't need land. I don't need fresh water. Like, whoa, this is a good economic model. So as soon as you draw a box in the ocean around, okay, things that don't swim away don't have to feed. There are 10,000 plants in the ocean. There are hundreds of kinds of shellfish. Like there could be an entire agricultural economy around something, but just if you listen and look at the sort of core benefits of the ocean and not be driven purely by market demand. Now, that's not easy. And we can go into all the challenges. Like I don't want to you know, say it's easy to do that way, but it's a must. 
And so that was my transition. So I started redesigning from my oysters. I then started to bring in different species and redesigning my farm and moving off bottom using the entire water column. Why did you move away from just oyster farming? Because a lot of people focus exclusively on oysters. Yeah. So I had a very successful oyster company. It was the beginning of that boutique, you know, selling into Brooklyn and Manhattan and things like that, high-end restaurants. It was great. And then Hurricane Sandy and Irene came in and wiped out my farm two years in a row. Like one storm is one thing, but you get two years in a row and you're like, once again, no jobs on a dead planet. Like I needed to figure out, it was a really depressing moment when like 90% of my crop gone, most of my gear destroyed. I was felt like I was going to get pushed off the water again. Like once again, like just as I'd remade myself as sort of a green fisherman doing oysters and learning from the entire oyster industry, here I am canary in the coal mine front lines of the climate crisis and my business destroyed. So after sort of picking myself up a little bit, it's like, okay, what can we borrow from land? Like, how do we think about this and become climate resilient and create business models that are climate resilient? So that means polyculture, right? So we grow oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, seaweeds. All of those come in different seasons. So we've got a crop year round. I move my farm off bottom. So I used to have 100 acres and I shrunk it down to 20 acres and grow more food than before because I'm using that entire water column. And then like designing around hurricanes, I, when I started design, I tried to like fight. I was like an oak in the ocean. I used things that would like try to stand up to the waves and weather and then redesign to just give in and be the, a willow, not an oak. So a storm comes through. We just had, you know, some good storms come through. The farm bends, goes underwater and then pops back up. So these are all sort of, that was the beginning of this journey of just trying to figure out. And I will say, it's not like I invented anything. There have been regenerative ocean farmers since the indigenous farmers in the Pacific Northwest 3,000 years ago building clam walls. Like this is something that's existed. There have been this peaks on east and west to grow and to try to modernize and figure out different species, I think. So I like stole, borrowed. I had incredible amount of support. I think what I did was bring different systems together into one system that worked in my area. So I like synthesized and now have an incredible team and we're just consistently trying to move that forward again and again. Recently, we just increased yields by a factor of five per acre with some new farming design. So I don't know, it's fun, you know, we need all hands on deck. We need new people in this industry and it's a fun space. Walk us through what it looks like if we were to go out fishing around your farm, what would it look like at the water level and then down below? How is this structured? So, you know, I run these eco tours. People come out and pay money and it's like a total ripoff. Because <laughs> you come out like, you know, you go to land-based farm and you see all these fields and people working, you see barns and all this beautiful stuff. You come up my farm, you, you, you're driving out and there's nothing to see. And I'm pointing at it and people are like squinting, trying to see. <laughs> and there's just a couple buoys on the surface because it's all underwater. It's just scaffolding. It's just like ropes and we call them lines in the ocean, but like sort of ropes and buoys. And just imagine like anchors on the edges, some ropes up to the surface, a buoy holding that. And then below the surface, you've got these horizontal ropes. And then from there, we grow our crops. So we have mussels hanging, and scallops, and oysters down the bottom, and in cages, and, and uh, seaweed growing vertically downward. But that low aesthetic impact has been really, really important. So our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places of the commons, right? right? Owned by everybody. And we don't even own that property. What we own is the right to grow shellfish and seaweed. It's almost like a process right. Anybody can come fish, swim, dive through our kelp forest, kayak, some of the best fishing in the entire area is on my farm because there's just so much stuff going on. And we have seals and ducks and like all this activity. So we get that social license, like not a huge visual impact. And we invite people in as opposed to keep them out. So that's what you you see. And like, you know, I was such a bad farmer at first. I was just, you know, as a fisherman, I just ran on adrenaline chase. You know, so we're, we're some of the last hunters on the earth, like commercial hunters. And um, farming was just this slow, methodical, boring, like I had to lower my coffee intake, you know, but no, like, like, it's just like hang out with these like tea drinking arugula farmers. Like I did not like it much, but over time, like I calm down and I just 
developed this sort of blue green thumb and got fascinated by growing stuff. And like, again, I never wanted to grow seaweed and I'd rather wish it was like hemp underwater. It would just sound cooler, right? To all my, my fishermen <laughs> friends. But like now when I, in the early spring, I'd be out there all, all winter and I bring this wall of plants from under the ocean. They're like 15, 20 feet long. Well, they go 400 feet long. It's just an entire wall of like chocolate brown shimmering plants. Like that's pretty amazing. So I don't get to chase fish, but I still get to feed my community, have a self-directed life, own my own boat, no boss, and just have this pride of cultivation, right? So I think we're on a road. Like if any of your folks at your place want to try a couple sea shanties about regenerative ocean farming, like we'll sing them at Greenway. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So through this process, you've invested years and years of fine-tuning your model. And through this established your nonprofit GreenWave, which provides open source design so anyone can come in and rip off what you have created. Why did you structure it that way? Yeah, I think one of the th good things I did is I there were two right moves I did. One was I didn't go to market too quickly, meaning I just stayed a petri dish experiment, made all my errors, made a living, but like didn't come out with like this big design, right? And like we get a lot of attention now, but forget there were 15 years in the dark, you know, like underwater trying to figure this out. So that was one thing. Like we, I think we picked the right time when it was workable, viable, not in its R&D stage to, to move out for replication. The other thing is I was pushed very heavily to – do like franchising models, things like that. And to take my model and, and have the business make money on replication. And I resisted that. And the reason was my goal is to create livelihoods for the 30,000 people thrown out of work, right? In Newfoundland, like that's the goal. It's not to become the kelp king, right? And that's great to be a kelp king, but that's just not like, that sounds kind of boring, right? <laughs> like, it's not interesting <laughs> to me, right? I'd rather do this like in my last breath when my boat is sinking and I'm happy and saying goodbye. Like, that's what I want. I want those folks. And I want to keep that culture alive, being just part of that. That's what innovation looks like to me, like keeping the fabric and the complexity and the beauty of all of our cultures, the shoreline cultures going. And I'm only a, you know, a tiny piece of it, of course. But the other reason is that I founded a nonprofit because there needed to be a space, a knowledge network, like a safe space without the financial incentives to create sharing really fast learning curves. Like what well, you've had 10,000 years to figure out how to grow corn, right? We've got 10 years to figure out how to do this before the planet dies. Like I don't want to be dark about it, but like the clock is ticking. We have to do so much hive mind and circular learning amongst all the farmers around the country, around the world, so we become better and better farmers really, really quickly so we can produce a tremendous amount of food in a regenerative way. And so the nonprofit, like I, we do have a plan for planned obsolescence, right? Like our view is if we can train 10,000 farmers, hatchery techs, workers in the next 10 years, then I can shut down Green Wave. Like there's an end game because I think then it has a life of its own. That's the, that's the sort of theory of change behind it. But right now what we do, and we work around the country and have a couple projects uh, globally, but we really do concentrate mostly on North America. And we've got this high touch program where we do farmer training and we work with indigenous communities and fishermen directly affected by climate change. And that's like very resource intensive. We're on the farms, they're on our farms. We help set up the first two indigenous owned seaweed hatcheries in the country, like we're finding markets for their crops. And then there's the low touch because we have a waiting list of 8,000 people in the U.S. for our farmer training program. That's without zero outreach. So I had to figure, we, got, we can't train all those people. Uh, and so developed online tools that we're just rolling out now. One, for example, is a, a farm design tool where you can put your lease size, your bottom type, the depth, a bunch of factors, and it'll spit out two different farm designs, an interactive budget, a gear list, and permitting language. That's incredible. What a resource. Yeah, that was complicated. <laughs> like, I had nothing to do with it. But all I said to people is, like, design something that I wish I had 20 years ago, right? We had that, and then a curriculum next to it, you know, from seed to harvest. And then next, we're rolling out, uh, we just built it, the farmer community, so people can learn for themselves. And that's interesting, like, who's in and who's out of that? Like, you have to have a lease to participate in that community. And is that all online? Yeah, all online. 
That's going to be released in February. We did a beta of the toolkit with 100 farmers around the country, and then we're making the tweaks now. But uh, we're really excited for it. And that just allows us eventually, again, to be irrelevant, right, is the real hope. And what we'll do is just listen to that community, keep making tools to put into the toolkit so that we're just sort of packaging those learnings. So that's like one side of our program. And the other side of the programming is innovation. We talk, we talk about markets a bit, but like one piece of that is really, I've got a team just looking at the choke points along the supply chain and trying to solve those issues. And then, you know, we have a buyer's network where buyers come and we match them with farmers and, and stuff like that. And then our R&D, okay. we do like, we've got 106 different strains of kelp on our farm for climate resilience. We have new farm designs, you know, all that sort of. And we have some interesting projects like where we're taking the kelp, using it for fertilizer to grow sweet potatoes as soil amendments. So that's our whole sort of R&D thing. So you have 8,000 inquiries from people who want to start farms. Are the folks who are currently farming able to earn a good living? Yeah. So one of our challenges right now agree with is how to track the metrics and success because there are 197 just seaweed permits in the country right now. We're able to track permits, hatcheries. There are probably 40 to 50 hatcheries around the country, and we're able to track yield. And yield right now has been going up, you know, like 40% a year, but it's it's still at like, just for kelp. I mean, shellfish is massive, which is great. But seaweeds is, is about, I don't know my number, but I think it's about uh, 2 million pounds right now. But I, based on the number of farmers, I think that's going to just go up exponentially. So there's someone like, let's say, Catherine Puckett in Block Island. She's growing oysters, clams, and kelp. She went from growing 2,000 pounds of seaweed over winter up to, she just got a new order for 30,000 pounds, uh, $2 a pound. That's real money. But I will say there's like farmers and then there's gardeners. And gardeners are people out with like a couple lines. It, I think it's not they're making a living. It's more of a sort of hobby. There are people that are gardeners now that really want to become farmers, right? So they're like in that learning stage. And one of the things Greenwave really works on is getting them up to the next level. So anyway, we're, I think we're very serious about trying to figure out those metrics, but it's complicated just so because it's so resource intense. Like there's no database out there from Noah or anybody of like, any of this stuff. So we called every no office around the country to find out how many permits, for example. But we'll get there. That's like where we're headed. You've been helping to develop these markets for kelp. And there are applications for kelp from bioplastics to fertilizer, and food, you can add it to cattle feed, and then they will burp less and emit less methane. And one of the really powerful applications for kelp is in its ability to absorb carbon. It's really good at carbon sequestration. And these days, as you know, there's the increasing focus on carbon dividends. And with that, we would put a price on carbon emissions, charge polluters, return that money to the people, and then create a national market for carbon credits. Since kelp is carbon negative, how would a price on carbon impact greenway farmers? Do you think that that could be a viable source of revenue? It's fascinating. Like we've been swimming around the carbon credit offset space quite a while. And like kelp is a, it is the sequoia of the sea, soaks up a tremendous amount of carbon. The question is, there's several questions. One question is like, where does that carbon go? So there's avoided carbon. So if someone eats kelp instead of lentils, that carbon still goes out, but it's, you, you, it's like less carbon than the lentils. Right. So like you're avoiding anything you eat on land basically has a higher footprint than things you're eating in the, in the ocean because of the zero input nature of it. Then there's drawdown. Then there's like sequestered carbon. They think about 12 percent of the kelp as you're growing it falls off and ends up in the deep ocean. So and it gets sequestered right. there for like a thousand years or something or more. They're, they're doing they're trying to figure exactly how much right now. World Wildlife Fund has a great project. I'm trying to figure exactly that out. Then there's the kelp you take out and you get into the soil. So you, instead of fossil fuel intensive fertilizers, you're using locally grown fertilizers on land-based farms. And then that carbon gets in the soil, that nitrogen gets in the soil and gets stabilized. Now we have to, have to, have to, in our economy as a whole, 
the markets have to reflect the positive externalities. The trouble is policy is too slow, like way, way, way too slow. It's going to take years and years and years to try to sort itself out. And that's what then created the offset market. And so everybody's like, okay, it's too slow. We're going to go the private way. Tons of companies come to us for offsets. The trouble with the offsets is that it's also too slow because the markets are too slow. So the price of carbon right now is like $35 a ton. Well, what's the goal of this, right? Is to ha incentivize farmers to plant more kelp or whatever, do more regenerative techniques on land and stuff like that. So that price has to be incentivized. And it's so low in the offset market just generally. So we did something, I'm just launching a new program just because I'm so annoyed and I've just taken so long and I just think, we just don't have time. So we just launched a philanthropic fund where farmers get paid 10 cents a pound above whatever they're getting paid for the good stuff that kelp does for the climate. Okay. And it's the kelp climate fund. And that 10 cents makes it worth it for a farmer to plant more and more and more and more. It aligns the incentive. So I kind of don't care right now what the market is saying about the price point. We're creating the vehicle, priming the pump. And then when the policy and markets figure it out, there will be this. And so we have farmers, you know, lined up. Anybody growing above 30,000 pounds will get 10 cents a pound on top of whatever they're paying. So, but that's philanthropic, right? But I think the markets will get there. I just want them to hurry up before we all drown a bird, you know. But what resiliency looks like is you grow food, your waste is going to agricultural products is like feed and things like that and bioplastics and things like that. And then you get blue and nitrogen carbon offsets, like that's another harvest. And then the last harvest is, can we harvest data and sell that? But the reason I care about that is like, you got polyculture of crops, but you also have polyculture of income streams. And it is so hard to grow food underwater because you can't see what you grow. I mean, Christ, I can't even swim. And so like, I can't see what I grow. I can't, I can't control it. And like my soil turns over a thousand times a day. Think about it. Like I can't augment it. I can't build hoop houses. I can't do any of it. I have so little control. So our models have to be extremely resilient to a changing environment. And that's kind of fun, quite honestly, but we can't just make widgets. Well, how do you bake in the resiliency since you don't have control over what's in the water and what the temperature is? So part of it is design. So like, let's say my waters are warming. I'm at the southern region of kelp, right, where my farm is. Waters are warming. And so like I get a spike in temperatures just before harvest. And the trouble is, is I'll get a lot of things growing on it, right? So the kelp, like it won't be harvestable if the waters are too warm. So I, the farm's designed so I can drop it, the whole thing, down to deeper waters where it's cold to wait for harvest. So like that's okay. one type of resilience. Like, the architectural design stuff is really fun. Like, so that's a piece of it. The other piece is taking that polyculture thing to the extreme. So I have a season that is bad because of environmental conditions. I have other crops I can sell through the year, year round. Like this is the reason you don't want to do monoculture, right? So you just have, so that's one thing. My kelp fails, I can do my clams and oysters. Then what happens if my whole crop fails for the whole year? Well, I still have sensors on my farm, which are collecting data. I'm still out there collecting physical data, packaging that. So is that a crop? All the things I was growing was breathing life back into the ocean. So I still have my blue carbon. It just went to the bottom of the sea, which is great, right? For, from a climate perspective. So I have the blue carbon piece. Diversity creates climate resilience. Now, I don't ever sell it. Like it makes things more complicated for sure. But I don't know how in the era of climate change, you don't run with that principle of diversity creates resilience. Just as from a farmer perspective, having been in a, growing in a highly volatile environment for 20 years, I think that's one thing I've learned. And you've touched a bit on GreenWave's emphasis on data. Could you elaborate on how you're thinking about data, collecting it, and what you're doing with it? So it's an early program right now, like we have sensors on the farm that are both weather stations that are collecting like temperature rating up and down column. We're getting a whole new suite of sensors out actually in the fall to measure nutrients and things like that. So that's okay. one piece is like wiring the farm. The other thing is we collect physical data. So we've got calculations where you, if you go out and measure the length of your kelp, the width, the amount per foot, you'll get yield estimates out of that. And that's really important data. We're measuring light penetration in a second. So all of this stuff. And 
the scientists really want it and the farmers really need it. Like if you plant your kelp in a two degrees difference temperature wise, it affects yields by like 20%, which is stunning. You need that sweet spot. And the NOAA data is too far away. Like I need micro data. The other thing is, you know, can we be measuring sea level rise, acidification, all sorts of different things on the farm? And again, package that and have it go to places like NOAA insurance companies that are trying to figure out new policy, different areas. In it. But that's like, that's a journey we're going on. I, I'm not sure it's going to work, but I do know data is essential for us anyway. Well, and through your data, you've been able to show that these farms actually reduce local ocean acidification. Is that right? Yeah, there's something called a halo effect, which is stunning, uh, where you surround a shellfish farm with seaweed. And inside the farm, you have lower acidification rates than outside. So they call it a halo effect. You know, these crops are just these, they're just stunningly powerful technologies. I right? like so again, yeah, you know, five to 20 times more carbon than land based plants. You know, an oyster filters 50 gallons of water a day pulling nitrogen. Like, they're just stunning. And our job is just to use those natural solutions to address some of the harms we see. So let's talk about these inquiries from the potential farmers. You've got 8,000 inquiries right now. Let's say half of them get set up and start farms. What kind of infrastructure needs to be in place to support them? I mean, you need hatcheries. So we think of it as a reef, right? So let's say 50 to 25 farms in an area, a hatchery, a processing hub, and then rings of entrepreneurs doing value added products. And then you replicate that reef everywhere there's a Home Depot, right? You know, it's like up and down the, the coast and you have distributed constant supply for ultra farms. But the problem with our model, the challenge, let's say, and this is a challenge on for land-based farms as well, is like our farming model is incredible underwater because it's so cheap, right? You know, it's like I got farmers where it's like $3,000 to set up an entire farm in Long Island in shallow waters. My farm was $20,000 to set up. If you go out in deeper waters, it gets, you know, more like $50,000. But like, this is so cheap to do relatively. When you hit the docks, suddenly costs go way up processing hubs, food logistics, you know, like all these different things. And I think that's where we need a lot of capital into the industry, like not for Greenway, but for part, you know, like folks dealing with that infrastructure in the middle challenge, capital and really creative thinking of what kind of capital, like what kind of capital stack should it look like, you know, because that infrastructure is low margin, capital intensive infrastructure. And again, this has been the challenge with land-based farming too hugely. Um, so folks really need to crack that nut. We're okay now because we have enough processors. And like the challenge I've had over the last, since we started Green Wave is you can't move one piece on the chessboard without the others. There are too many farmers, your supply goes up and there's not enough infrastructure, or if like markets fall behind and there's too much infrastructure, you know, like obvious stuff. And so we've had to move each piece on the chessboard right now, I'd say in the country, we're in a good space where there's an equal number of farmers who can scale processors and market pull. There's actually on the East Coast, not enough kelp right now to meet the existing market for plant-based foods, which is really good. Really? From the foods? Not even thinking about the other applications? Absolutely. So, you know, our model of we've got a whole leaf strategy. We talk about that. It goes to specialty foods wholesale, plant-based foods, and then fertilizer, uh, compost feed, and then bioplastics. Each of those have a different price point. Average over the whole plant, you want $2 a pound to make a living as a farmer. So, you know, we do specialty products like kelp bread and butter pickles, kelp curries, mustards. That's like nice boutique stuff in Brooklyn, right? But that's not going to build a huge scale economy, but it's nice for high value. You know, it's like 13 bucks a pound. But the plant-based burger, Ku is a great company that's doing kelp and mushroom burgers, and they're they're very good. They're delicious, and that's coming for someone who does not enjoy kelp. And so, yeah, that plant-based piece is a huge market because it's you know it, everywhere it is, and our crops can be price competitive because there's zero input. Like anybody else is doing soy and all the other stuff they put in things, they got to use water, fertilizer, they got to use land, they got nutrient deficiencies. We don't have any of that. 
For our listeners in Kansas City who are really interested in what you're doing, but they're just not going to be able to access the water on a daily basis, how can they support this movement in Greenwave and in regenerative ocean farming more broadly? Yeah. So, I mean, there's one like technical piece where, you know, they're just trying to figure out the like the genome of kelp and kelp fertilizers. I mean, in the early 1900s, there were 1,500 workers on the docks of San Diego processing kelp for 700 farms in the Midwest for fertilizer and feed. That's the early 1900s. And if you can take seaweeds and get them into the soil as fertilizer in land-based agriculture, I think you, you can have a very fast climate impact, right? So that's one way. Like the, I think the Midwest matters that kelp is cheap to – it's so light, it's cheap to ship. That's one. The other thing is we actually work with universities in the center of the country who are doing a lot of the high-tech lab stuff with like fresh packaging, uh, sequencing, doing the – like they're doing all their stuff in their labs. So that's the other thing. But um, the other thing is, I mean, just in a very simple direct way, you can support Green Wave, you know, sponsor farmers and things like that. The other thing is like is this orientation of like – Right now, the strategy is to build seawalls and flee the coast. Like everybody in the center country is watching that happen in the East Coast, you know, on both coasts. And so why should they care? Well, part of saving the planet is turning around, embracing the ocean as a climate solution. Like it is going to be core to reduce carbon, to feed the planet, to save civilizations. We know it. So like you want to support the Blue New Deal or whatever it is in order to save your community. And it feels like it reached, but like you said, you know what, it's 70% of the world's water. Like that is where our expansion of climate resilience solutions, it's one of the major places where it will have to happen and it is going to happen. So I think oddly enough, NOAA matters <laughs> to folks in Kansas at this point. And then, you know, just, it's fun. Like order some kelp and see if you're a good enough cook to make this weird thing delicious. Let's turn to our rapid fire hot seat questions. Are you ready? Yep. First is the most important advice I have followed is uh, figure out what you're really bad at and don't do it. <laughs> like find people next to you that are really good at doing the stuff you really suck at. The most important advice or feedback I have rejected is take every idea and treat it as a profit opportunity. We need new business models that are climate resilient. I'm most inspired by. It is stunning how many people are out on the ground doing like very concrete climate solutions out there all around the world. It is just stunning to, to, to like take a ride through that global community of people every day waking up and trying to do this. And it's not like it's blue. There, there is, yes, the sort of white collar, but there is a massive movement of blue collar innovation of people trying to solve these problems. So fishermen, like we are all experiencing it and we are <laughs> really excited amongst us <laughs> to talk about it and to solve it and to bring our creativity and bring our agency to it. And so that has been just stunning to join that. Your humans are so good at stuff. We're too good at what we do. The reason we caught all the fish is we got too good at fishing, right? Like, let's get too good at solving climate change. Like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> let's do that. The best job I've ever had was? Oh, God. Uh, on the Bering Sea with a shotgun shooting seagulls at the age of, like, <laughs> 17. <laughs> it, was, it, was, like, it was the best job. All downhill from there. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, so they didn't steal the bait off the log lines. Yeah. God, that was a good job. <laughs> and then finally, finish the sentence. To me, climate positive means? Solving both climate change and economic inequality at the same time. Keeping those linked. And climate positive is we get this chance to build something beautiful and do food right and something that we can look back on and be truly proud of where communities benefited and we did delicious, beautiful food and scaled the economy exponentially for America. It's like, this is such a opportunity, but we got to hold all these things together at once so everybody benefits. I love that. Thank you so much, Bren, for joining us. I'm 
I'm inspired by what you've been doing with Green Wave and your team. And we are excited to see where you go in the next five and 10 years as we try to tackle climate change. I mean, is this cool that like, who would have guessed that we'd be all hanging out together? It's climate change that's bringing all of us <laughs> together, right? That yeah. we get to talk to right. each other on this. And this is all because it's climate change. Like, this is going to be a fun creative journey. We might all burn and drown in the end, but it's going to be a good, a good ride. <laughs> we'll have good conversations on the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good. Okay, so make sure someone writes a sea shanty yeah, about regenerative ocean farming. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll send you a recording. Uh, perfect. Okay, good. Thanks so much. Honored to be here. Climate Positive is produced by Hannah Armstrong. Tell us what you thought about the conversation. You can send us show ideas by tweeting at us at Hannah Armstrong or send us a note at climatepositive at hannahnarmstrong.com. If you like the show, feel free to give us a rating or share with a friend. It helps others learn about the show and our climate positive mission. I'm Chad Reed, and this is Climate Positive.